This Week in Startups is brought to you by Gusto, an easy online payroll, benefits, and HR built for modern small businesses. Get three months free when you run your first payroll at gusto.com slash twist. Cruise Consulting, a leading tax CPA who works exclusively with funded startups. Go to cruiseconsulting.com slash twist and get a free tax consultation and R&D tax credit white paper. And Squarespace, turn your idea into a new website. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. It's 2019, and we are ready to do our first news roundtable. And the news has been insane this year. With me to discuss it all, my good friend, frequent collaborator, and the founder of Gizmodo in Gadget and Gadget, Peter Rojas. Welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks. Good to be back. Good to be back. We both got caught in the blizzard in uh, Truckee and we Tahoe. We stuck in the same place in the mountains. But we got back. We got back. Which is good. Uh, and now you're, of course, a partner at Betawork Ventures, my friend John Borthwick in New York. You work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we run uh, the fund together. Run the fund together. And uh, you invest in, what, a dozen companies a year? Half dozen? Oh, uh, so we end up doing about seven to 10 sort of seed investments. And then we have um, this investment program called Camp, where we usually make about another 10 to 15. Amazing. Um, like really early, like pre-seed things. Pre-seed yeah. as well. In wow. fact, I need to plug. Oh, here we go. Okay. Plug it up. So we're doing our next program, which is a new category we're calling synthetic reality. Synthetic reality. Yeah. Does that include AR and VR? So it's really around um, products that are starting to blur the boundaries between the real and the fake. So we're okay. interested in like avatars, digital celebrities, like the little Michaela type stuff. Got it. Uh, algorithmically generated content, but also tools for detecting fake news and kind of fake content. Oh, because you have real fakes now. Yeah. Yeah, like that the are deep happening, fakes. Deep so, fakes. So we're interested in like all this sort of stuff where it's like, I love uh, you it. know, who comes up with this theme every year when you do this? So we work at what we we kind of come up with it together. Ah. Uh, and but in this uh, case, who came up with it? Uh, well, it was partly John and partly me. Okay. Uh, and so John had been, uh, you know, thinking a lot about like. So the you just smoke a huge like bowl, <laughs> and then something comes out of that. Well, you know what happens is we start to you see Joe Rogan it. <laughs> we start to see you know activity in an area. We start to see people building stuff, and, and ah. one of the things that we've noticed is that there's a lot of startups that are working on these like new tools for democratizing, creating CGI that are using. Like there's this whole thing called generative adversarial networks. It's this new technique that came out a few years ago, and the stuff that's happening there is absolutely insane. Wait, general generative generative okay, adversarial as in creating networks. adversarial it's being just, counter. It's, it's just like networks. this new kind of like it's not really a neural network exactly, but it's a new kind of like like called GANs. Yeah, GANs, and it's a way to um, do things like an example. One that I've seen is you could take a um, uh, a video of someone dancing. Yeah. And then you could, I could take that footage and then put your, basically your body and then have you dancing, doing that right. same dance. Got it. Um, like, well, actually people saw that. The, I don't know if you saw the uh, Cortez video. That was actually me on the roof and they put her on it. <laughs> It, it's the kind of stuff no. that's like, you know. No. You don't even know if that's you happening. You don't even know. You and, need to give like 50 or 100 photos to do this. Well, uh, what's interesting is how, um, you know, you're able to take. Did you see this thing that went around a couple weeks ago where it was a tweet about how it was like a dozen faces that were all generated by yes. a computer? That was using GANs. Got it. Like, it, it's not, it was an actual photo of a real per any individual person. It was all generated by this algorithm. And okay, so, and if people want to join the synthetic reality, is it an incubator, would you call it? It's, or like, a camp? A, it's like a three-month investment program, kind of like cool. an accelerator. Um, so beta.works slash camp. That's the word it plays. Beta dot dot works. works. Yep. So B-E-T-A dot yep. W-R-K-S yep. slash, slash camp. Camp, got it. Okay. And so it's a three-month program. We, in, we make an investment uh, and uh, work with the companies really closely. And what's cool is because you're all working around a really specific topic, um, there ends up being a lot of co like collaboration. Of and, course. And Do you ever have a couple of companies merge? Uh, uh, we have one that's happening right now. Yeah, see, that's yeah. what I think happens in those two. Yeah. I've always thought about that as an idea, because you get people in early who have the idea. You might have one group that's making a tool, another group that's making a consumer app. You're like, you know. That's exactly actually what's happening right now. Is yeah. one, one that raises Series A is now acquiring one that, that just raised Pre-Seed. Yeah, see, it's so. you need to have a little bit more wood behind the arrow. You need to have a little bit more tech talent. Speaking of talent, Monique Woodward is back with us. Hey, hey Jackie, how'd you like that? You like that segue? <laughs> Executive producer Jackie, she loves my segues. <laughs> Monique Woodward, welcome back to the program. Of course, people know you. You became very famous uh, running the 500 Startups programs. You're now independent here investing. Yes. How are you doing? Good. Ready Things for are good. 2019? 
I'm really ready for 2019. Um, last year was fun. I did three new investments, which was a little bit down from the earlier years, but I really just found three companies that I was super passionate about and, and kind of dove deep into those. Tell us. Uh, one is in, I'll tell you the last one I did, which was right before the holidays. It was in Contos Media, which is a multicultural media brand. They've already partnered with Nickelodeon, Nick Jr. And basically, it's four founders, four Latinx founders who had kids and realized that there wasn't a lot of multicultural media um, on the market for them. If you take a look at uh, Dora the Explorer, yeah. that product is like 20 years old now. Right. Um, so they've started to create multicultural media that speaks to families that are Latinx, Asian, Indian. So I think it's a really good market. It's a really big market. And, you know, huge. Yeah. As people of color become the majority in the United States, it's going to be an even bigger um, opportunity. I've become acutely aware of this now that my daughter, who is mixed race, she's Korean and whatever I am, Irish, Swedish and Greek. Um, and but she looks Korean uh, and. She said to me the other day, or we were talking, and she said she wanted to have blonde hair and be white. Mm. It's a very interesting yeah. moment, right? Cause she, and I was like, why is that? And he's like, oh, well, that's this Barbie doll I like, or whatever. Right. And what do we like to be? I'm like, well, you're kind of like half white, but okay, let's pull the string a little bit and, and think about it. And up until, uh, let's see, all the Disney stuff that we watched, there were just nobody who yeah. was Asian, right? And then I think we had one. Mulan or Mulan, yeah. Mulan. Right, Mulan is but it's really like the representation issue you start to realize gosh you know it actually has a huge impact on yeah. young kids because if they can't see themselves on the screen exactly it, and as kids are becoming more and more multi multicultural that's becoming a, a more apparent problem and a thing to be solved and an opportunity for yeah. companies like Encantos certainly an opportunity when you think about multiculturalism is you know the we use this term minority, and it's like, mm, no, it's actually, actually majority. majority. <laughs> California is only 38% white now, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so. we're dying breed, Peter. Well, Boo speak to yourself. I'm, I'm half Peruvian, so. <laughs> oh, that's true. Actually. So you would fall into Latinx, I guess. Yeah. No, I mean, I I, I mean, I have dual citizenship, and, you know, I, I did just, 23 and me and the whole thing. Are you really? I, yeah. You did 23 and me? Oh, yeah. Have you done 23 and me? No, I don't, I don't do that. I'm a little concerned about it. I'll just say... I don't care who has my DNA. Clone <laughs> me, do whatever you need to do. I, uh, somebody notable on Twitter was like, can I take myself out of 23andMe permanently, including their backup files? You can. Yes, you can. But would it delete you in the archives and backup files? In other words, yes. if a crime got committed and they compelled 23andMe or one of these other ones to pull the data from their di backups, because you know these companies all back up every yeah. minute of every day, do they purge their backups? That... I mean, they've. I've looked. I mean, I looked at it, and that you know, if you ask to be deleted, they will. But the thing is, they don't necessarily need to have you as long mm. as they have. Like they caught the California killer, right? Or whatever, because it was a Golden close State relative. Killer, because it was yeah. close relative, so they're able to sort of, you know, triangulate. I yeah. regularly speak to my my family and say, "Do not give your DNA to anyone." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the the thing that's uh, fascinating about it is, I now know of three or four instances of people who have siblings half sisters, half brothers, that they have found because of oh. these services. I, ha I have three or four close friends. And one of them was going through this, met his sister. She, and then there was just an article from the woman who did, um, might have been Prozac Nation or whatever. She's sort of really oh, good. Oh yeah, her father turned out to not be. Her father. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. a New York Magazine article and I think it's called Bastard is the name of the article. Uh, we can look it up, it's in New York Magazine. And she wrote this great article about, she had this family friend who her mom would bring around, who was this famous photographer, and he would come to her recitals and this and that, and give her presents. And it turns out, after he died, she found out it was her father. Yeah. At 50. Wow. Can you imagine you're 50 years old and the person you thought was your father is not? And then in my other friend's instance, he met his half-sister, and the half-sister said, I always knew something was different. And then they did the DNA test, and... I guess she was converting to Judaism because of her marriage. And it turned out she was 49% Jewish anyway. She didn't yeah. know it. So all this like crazy stuff occurred. Well, there's a, yeah. a great piece in the Times, I think last year about where they had people um, uh, sort of say, you know, what they thought their ethnic composition was. Uh -huh. And then they did the test. And a lot of them found out like what they thought they were did not match mm -hmm. at all the reality of, uh, of, of, you know, what they actually were. It was, it's really interesting. It's a brave new world. Yeah, I mean, I found. I mean, personally, like, I found out um, that was about like 
seven or eight percent uh, Native American through, per, but you know, to, for Peru, um, through like basically wow. like, you know the Andean uh, you know Inca uh, culture there. Um, but also, I was like six percent Ashkenazi Jew. Huh. And it turns out that I had like a great 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 grandfather. Were you raised Catholic or Protestant? I was. Well, my family is Catholic, but right. um, well, my dad was Catholic. My mom was Greek yeah. Orthodox, but because um, she's Greek. Right. Uh, but it turns out that on my dad's side, there was somebody who had migrated from Poland. <gasps> to Peru in like the 1870s or something 1870s? like that. 1870s? What a pioneer. The, the pogroms, you know, like the, wow. the, the um, and Crazy. so that's where I have like, and I had no idea. All right. Welcome to this week in genealogy, yeah. everybody. <laughs> hey, uh, CES is going on and it seems like 5G is becoming reality or is the talk of the town. Peter, you're our techie here. What is 5G? Define it for the audience who we hear it, we know it's the next thing. Yeah. What is it exactly? What makes it unique? So, uh, so you know, it's the fifth generation of wireless uh, technology, right? And so we've Got had it. now, um, you know, three G sucked. Three G was where it started to get okay, yeah, uh, but wasn't quite there. Four G now we're all pretty happy with LTE. Yeah. Um, but with five G, it's going to have two big shifts. One is it's not just going to be faster. We'll start to get to sort of these gigabit speeds um, on your phone. On your phone in theory, right? Under ideal conditions. Okay. Um, but the other thing that's going to make a big difference, which gets less attention, is that latency will actually go way down. Ah. Again, under ideal conditions. Uh, so there's 100 millisecond, so 10 milliseconds. You can get down to like one or two milliseconds. Which is bonkers. Which is incredibly it's like fiber fast. levels. And one of the things that's important about it is that there are a lot of kind of real-time applications, including autonomous driving and things like that, where having that level of latency can make a huge difference in being able to um, tap into cloud processing and, and things like that. And so one of the things that is happening with 5G is that a lot of these um, base stations and things are actually going to have edge computing in them Ooh. to be able to you know get even closer to the device. All right, when we get back from this quick yeah. break, I want uh, Monique and Peter, you to tell me what do we think the opportunity is as investors for 5G? And I'll give you a great opportunity right now. If you're a small business owner, you're going to be wearing a lot of hats. And Gusto makes payroll, taxes, and HR easy for small businesses. We use it. We love it. It's fast and it's simple payroll processing. You get benefits and expert HR support all in one place. It automatically pays and files your federal, state, and local taxes. And it's easy to add health benefits and the 401k like we did this year. Da -da 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 -da. My team loves me for getting that 401k set up. It's quick and easy onboarding according to Ashley, my managing director and my former chief of staff. And they're persistent and helpful with their communication. Never annoying, but they are helpful and persistent in making sure you do this right and you have to do it right. Excellent, excellent customer service on chat and phone. And I love chat customer service because I can multitask. And it's great to have a payroll and all the benefits in one place, according to Ashley, uh, who runs operations here at launch. Commuter benefits, health, dental, vision, 401k, 529, huh, for your kids, HSA, all that great stuff. So now is the best time for you to get set up for the new year. Do not wait. Listeners will get three months free when they run their first payroll. Think about that, huh? Three months on the arm for This Week in Startups listeners. Go ahead and go to gusto.com slash twist. Once again, that's G-U-S-T-O dot com slash twist. We use it. We love it. It's awesome. And so is 5G. Are we starting to see, Monique, startups that have 5G, 5G in their deck? This is the why now? No. I haven't seen one yet. Not at all. It's still early. I've seen still early. one or two referencing it, but it's still pretty early. And what were they working on? Uh, one of them was uh, doing like an autonomous, you know, okay. vehicle type related yeah. thing. It wasn't a car itself, but it was um, doing uh, augmented reality and data in the car. Got it. So when we talk about 5G, if the latency gets that low, now you could take, let's take a Tesla with the sensors, all that sensor data. If you wanted to send all that sensor data, let alone a live video feed, because they have cameras in it. Mm -hmm. live video feeds from all these Teslas up into the cloud and you do some real-time data processing on them, it wouldn't be possible be to use that data in real time. You, would, you could store it, process it, and later on have it impact self-driving, but you couldn't do it in real time. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Peter? Uh, even with 5G, you mean? No, or with 5G, you could. With 4G, you couldn't. With 5G, it makes it easier, right? Easier. Um, I think that the, the challenge, I think, for the AV stuff is that... Um, you know, is it always going to be a reliable enough a connection? One right. of the issues with 5G is that the range is going to be shorter. And ah. so they actually have to have more microcells to get 
pr proper 5G coverage you have to have what these call these microcells in way more places. And it's actually been an issue with deployment because a lot of cities are saying it's one no thing to more have. towers. Well, yeah. now you got to put these everywhere for a Ugh, and they're so ugly. I like the well, ones they're that smaller, are smaller, so it's, it's oh, is that good? yeah, but it's it's still it is going to be an issue. What would the change be when we open our phones? What will we first notice on our 5G phones? And the iPhone 10 series does it have 5G support in it yet or not? It doesn't. So the iPhone is probably not going to get 5G support until 2020 at the earliest. Okay. Um, Samsung is introducing a phone with 5G, uh, at least one with 5G uh -huh. uh, this year. Whether that'll be the um, the S10 or not, right. not totally clear. Could be. When I was in Qatar or Qatar, as some people say, they had 5G, and they were making a big deal about it at the airport and places. But I was like, but nobody has a 5G phone. Yeah, I think there's. Mm, as far as I don't think there are really any phones available. Um, yeah. You're starting to see some routers uh, which use 5G for the backhaul, uh, and uh. so you can put them in your house instead of. Remember how you get those like little MiFi things from Verizon? Yes. Um, so that that kind of thing uh, uh. to replace having you know cable or DSL or whatever uh, in your so house. So that could be the future. Is you could have 5G. Here we yeah, go. The D-Link things. 5G will cut your cords yeah. forever. So you get this D-Link router. You put it in your house. You yeah, connect to 5G and you kick out cable. Yes. Or fiber. And Verizon's actually introduced this as well. Um, Verizon and AT&T are, are, are introducing this. And the idea and is... Good. Well, the idea is that, you know, for a lot of consumers that this would be something that they would do instead of doing Comcast, for hmm. example. Well, this would certainly open up more competition. It will, well, Verizon already goes to your home with DSL and fiber in some cases. Yeah. I, I think that the challenge for this stuff is wireless... Um, it's hard to get on, you know, I mean, I have, uh, uh, you know, gigabit fiber service, which is actually has unlimited data. A lot of people uh, Comcast would, they might have three or four or 500, you know, terabytes, I think of data you might yeah. get per month. Right. Uh, and, um, I think with this 5g, Oh, it, it might be limited. It's going to be pretty limited because like, it's going to be expensive at first uh, to provide. So it's not like you're going to go and just get unlimited 5g, you know, streaming Netflix and 4K service yeah. gets, gets pricey. So once the price does start to drop, um, I'm an investor in a bunch of, a uh, few media companies like Bla famously Blavity. Um, yeah. Who you had we just here. had Morgan on, yeah. Yeah, you just had Morgan, Morgan right? on. Yeah. 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 She's great. Um, how much more media can we actually consume? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's actually a, a, a good question. There, there doesn't seem to, we sit, we sit, I don't think we've hit the limit quite yet. <laughs> um, but I think there's also 4K consumes a lot of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, um, and if you started to watch, again, if you've watched like Netflix and things like that in 4K, it's pretty good, but it's actually pretty highly compressed. And so when they yeah. can start to actually um, have a less compressed stream, the picture quality will actually be even better. Yeah. I saw that Tom Cruise was on Twitter asking everybody to change their... Oh, turn off the motion blur. Tur turn off motion blur so you yeah. can see blurry movies again. Yes. Well, Explain what that's about. Okay. Well, this is totally different, but... Um, I so, know, but it's, it's, it's... it was. I think it was Tom Cruise's greatest moment as an actor. Uh, it it made, made everyone sort of come together and, and like him. Yeah, everybody loved him. <laughs> uh, so a lot of TVs now, they have these um, sort of features which try to um, smooth over uh, the picture uh -huh. and um, uh, and it creates uh, more of a like a soap opera like TV mm. show type effect mm. in a lot of things and so uh, oftentimes when you get a new TV uh, you know big 4K TV or something like that it's on by default right and so a lot of people don't realize and you have to actually go in and what do they call it again motion motion blur there's yeah. like a few different names for mm. it every company has their every brand has their so own so he's teaching people how to do it yeah how to switch it off and it's one of the things that when I got my TV a few years ago it's one of the first thing I did was I switched I gotta it off. go do that I just got a new Sony with 4K and you gotta switch it off yeah I'm fascinated by the fact that Tom Cruise of all people was tweeting about yeah. turning off the motion blur yeah yeah and not Xenu or something like that. <laughs> exactly. Well, it was interesting thing about it is I think if you're watching a basketball game, which is my my primary primary case for the only time I go in front of the TV is to watch the Knicks lose, is like it does make watching a basketball game, which used to be like, you know, when somebody like Stefan Marbury would zip to the basket, like it could blur, and this makes it like whoa. Yeah, exactly. Sports is actually great the, the, for sports. The best use case for it, right? Yeah, it, it, and some gaming. Uh, I think uh, everything else, like a movie, especially if you're watching something that's really cinematic like a western or something like that it's gonna make it look terrible the thing that's seems to have taken over the dialogue at least in consumer electronics the last month is apple's 
plateauing of the iPhone ecosystem. What do you think about this, Monique? What does it say that they're just so good at making iPhones that <laughs> people don't need to upgrade anymore or that there's no nothing left to increase the experience now that we're in year 10 plus of the well, iPhone? Well, I think we reached peak cost of the iPhone. Yeah, it feels because, like that. <laughs> yeah, it definitely feels like peak cost, right? And so at this point, um, a lot of people are arguing that the Google Pixel, the latest Google Pixel, has better features compared yeah. to a much pricier Apple iPhone. Yeah. So I think, one, we've reached peak cost. Two, everyone who has an iPhone, to some extent, has one now. Yeah. And so what? where is Apple innovating? Yeah. Um, and I think... You know, not to be very Jobsian about it, but I think if Steve Jobs was here, um, we would have had something much newer that really pushed um, pushed the technology a lot further yeah. than where we are now. And I just don't think we have that anymore. Yeah, it does feel like I got the Pixel two, and compared to the iPhone eight, was I guess when those two were contemporaries, and then I got the iPhone X, and I'm going to upgrade to the Pixel three maybe in a couple of months because I like to have one of each. And I have to say that Pixel two was like faster than my iPhone 10. Yeah. And I was pretty impressed with how snappy it was. And the photo quality is the photo, comparatively sick. better. The camera on the Pixel yeah. 3 is just... It's I ridiculous mean, for the, low light. The, the, yeah, the, the night you know, uh, can't, a feature that it has. Yeah, I was talking to Ohm, Malik, our friend, who's like, you mm -hmm. know, carries around these other cameras. And he's like, yeah, the you know, some of these new... F f I can take better photos with this than my mm -hmm. SLR or whatever other ones they're well, using. It's because it's software. Yeah, it's computational photography. And I think... Computational photography. Yeah, and, and I think what... You know, it's actually, you know, one of the things that we actually have been talking about with the sort of synthetic reality is that when you take a picture with your phone now, there is so much computation happening in the back to kind of create the image that you're not just capturing the light and having this sort of honest mm -hmm. representation. Every time you pick a picture with your iPhone, it's basically a lie of some kind yeah. or another. Yeah. And um, I, I was it's talking. It's not with, reality. Yeah. And I was talking with someone at a drone company yesterday about this, and he said that for their consumer customers, they have all this computation to like you know make the images look right. But for enterprise, for their corporate customers, they want all that off. They're like, we just they want, want the, ground truth. Yeah. We we need to see exactly what this is. We don't want all the manipulation and all the you know stuff that but happens. Don't to, fix it. it. Don't fix it. Exactly. We need to see what it really looks like. Well, I'm coming out the JCal uh, 10 phone, and what it does is it just automatically makes your BMI, your body mass index, a 22. <laughs> just immediately, everybody's thin and beautiful in mine. All the bags yes. under your eyes go away. I mean, that is the Black Mirror version yeah. of this. Like, will the default when he be yeah. to it's, just it's the Photoshop? Cat, it's the catfish phone. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> but isn't there that's that Japanese, that Chinese company that had the uh, selfie app where it would Oh, yes. Every, Give you abs? No. Well, there's one, but it automatically, like, you know, makes you look prettier. Yeah. You know, or more handsome. That... Well, it's this layer of non-reality reality. It's it's a layer of fakeness that's sort of across the entire internet, um, and especially in our photos. Yeah. Like, my life isn't the life I have on Instagram. People think I'm just traveling all the time. I not, know. Not sitting in my apartment slaving away. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, we should all just, for one week, take the actual view. Yeah. And it's literally like a view of a keyboard, yes. the inside of your refrigerator, and your <laughs> ceiling while you're in bed, you yeah. know, like playing threes or whatever you, whatever game you play on your phone. Watching billions. That's yeah. it. Watching billions. <laughs> that's it. That It's my feet and billions behind my feet. That's on, honest Graham. Yeah, honest Graham. Yeah. Um, I'm into it. Make it trends, Jason. Uh, and robots seem to be um, now becoming a little more de rigueur. Um, obviously, we're big investors here at Launch at Cafe X. I saw it was a bread robot. Did you see that yeah, one? I saw that I one. Saw that. I was like, oh, that one seems like a, a winner to me. I want to meet those founders. <laughs> Fresh bread, 24 hours a day. Imagine if there was like a bread station at one of the BART stations or like or on like a New York City subway station, you get off of 14th Street and there's a bread machine. There would be a line out the door yeah. to get fresh bread is so brilliant to have robots take over this work and do it 24 hours a day. You worry when you get all about loss of those jobs or do you, cause we're on record low unemployment. Yeah. Well, I, I do think that we'll end up losing a lot of jobs based on robots, autonomous driving, uh, you know, trucking is one of the biggest industries. You're going to mm -hmm. lose those jobs. But I think right now we're in at the moment where we can scale up people to, get new, better jobs. Yeah. Um, Lambda School just raised a big round yesterday. Yeah. Um, super excited about what they're doing over there. Yeah, I had Austin on oh, the podcast, yeah. He seems amazing. 
He's pretty great. Not amazing enough to include me in the round, though. I was like, yeah, I got, you got, <laughs> kind of got off the show, and I was like, yeah, hey, yeah, no, save your slice for J-Cal. He's like, oh, round's closed, couldn't fit you in. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's yeah. a first. <laughs> yeah. But I love what he's doing and yeah. reskilling people in these these high demand jobs like yeah. data science and, and software development. And then, um, you and know. And it's free. You apply. And you get in free. for free. And they take a percentage of your your propo- your salary after you finish the program. And if you don't find a job, um, w- certainly with their help, they don't take that cut. So yeah. I think it's a really smart way of reskilling these people and getting them into a different part of the labor market. Because if we just say, okay, we're going to keep these um, low skilled labor jobs, yeah. I think it, it it we do it at a detriment to people um, over the long run. We and do I, it at, at a detriment to um, their earning power. We do it at a detriment to our ability to, to innovate as a country. Yeah, and you have to apply to get into the program. So they don't take everybody. You have to show potential and seriousness. And then the percentage they take of your salary, I believe, is capped till you pay it back. It's not unlimited. I think it's, I want to say it's 17%. It's 17% is that right? per year until you pay it back. Until you pay it back. Which is, and I think it's 30000 It's capped at 30, 30 k yeah. Which is nothing. It's like one, it's less than one year in private school now. I went to University of Miami and I think I it was $27,000 a year. Not all. And that was not this year. That was a couple years ago. That was ago. a million years ago. <laughs> that was like, uh, you know, like that two years. That's about four years ago. Ages. It was a long time ago when you graduated. <laughs> when we get back, I want to talk to you about the reaction to that story, which was uh, indentured servitude. And uh, I'll even go to the third rail. Somebody was saying this is like some new modern day slavery. I want to get your reactions to the negativity to the story when we get back. And let me tell you right now about Cruise Consulting. Startups can save thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands in payroll taxes next year. What? What are you talking about, Jake Al? Well, I'm talking about taking advantage of R&D tax credits. Yes, R&D tax credits are complicated, and your startup tax expert, Cruise Consulting, K-R-U-Z-E, can help you with that. Most tax CPAs don't know anything about startups, and you need to make sure that taxes are done correctly so you can survive due diligence and you can cut your burn. If your taxes are janky, you are not going to raise your next round. It is going to be a problem. And we love Cruise Consulting because they'll set up your startup to fly through financial and tax due diligence in their next round. We love when our startups know how to do their taxes properly. And it is a problem when they screw it up. I can tell you that. Cruise clients are going to save $3 million dollars this year in payroll taxes. Some of their customers include da, 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 Superhuman. Yes, that's right. Superhuman says they are huge fans of Vanessa and the folks at Cruise Consulting who set up their books, financing, and other operations. And I can tell you, Superhuman is doing amazingly. As well as Casey, VP of Operations at da, 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 Calm, another one of my investments. They say, as a startup, moving quickly is a top priority. And we just need to get our tax returns done period. After we uploaded our docs, we got a tax return in three days. E-filing was confirmed by day four. They're super responsive and helpful. Those are two of my breakout portfolio companies, Common Superhuman, who are using Cruise Consulting. And if you are a seed or venture funded Delaware C-Corp, go to cruiseconsulting.com slash twist and get a tax, get a free tax consultation and R&D tax credit white paper. That's K-R-U-Z-E consulting, C-O-N-S-U-L-T-I-N-G dot com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T. Go get that white paper and get that free tax consultation. Thanks to my friends at Superhuman and Com for giving us those endorsements uh, for Cruise Consulting. Okay. People are cynical. Uh, yesterday after this like big story in the New York Times uh, about the Lambda School, mm-hmm. people are like, oh, look. Silicon Valley has invented like invented taxes, 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 and I was like, yeah. "Listen, dipshit, uh, <laughs> did you read the article? Like, or do you know how they work? What did you think of this cynical uh, portrayal of a company that's giving free education contingent on you getting a job? Shouldn't all colleges be set up this way? Wouldn't right. it be the world be better if this is how colleges were? Yes. I mean, I I personally I think that um, you know higher education should be like it is in a lot of European countries, it should be free or very low cost. I think a model where you do have some sort of um, garnish of 
future income or something like that is a reasonable way to you know get people educated as opposed to having them take on a huge amount of debt, which is um, in a way the same thing, right? Except much more punitive because right. of the you know the debt load that people have and the way that it can really um, significantly impact their ability to get on their feet after they graduate. Tying it to percentage of revenue uh, of revenue future revenues based upon what they taught you creates yeah. alignment. I mean, people are dying under student loans, and they're often student loans for uh, areas that are not going to get them the highest paying jobs. Right. Right. So, you know, I saw beauticians were like going into debt for tens of thousands of dollars to get $10 an hour jobs. Right. Or, you know, someone who studies philosophy, which is not a bad major, but you might not end up with a very high paying job with that with well, that why type don't you of major. take the philosophy manager job at Betaworks. <laughs> right. yeah. I, well, I do have a master's degree a in head English, of philosophy. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, English, I mean, yeah, maybe. It, it, it's so cynical. Te- I think tech now has gone from yeah. underdog to hero to now villain. We are squarely in the villain phase. It's like the warriors. Yeah. They were underdogs. You know, they recruit Steph Curry and they're like, oh yeah, that guy's like so skinny. He's going to like not make it through like the season. They become heroes for winning and changing the game of basketball. And now everybody hates them. That's where tech is right now. But, you yeah. know, but this is what happens when there's a breach of trust, right? And you've seen that there have been player, players in this category, in tech, who have done some pretty shady things. I mean, I, pretty gnarly. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think that... Um, Zuckerberg. <laughs> that's the most pro- high profile example, right? And I think that... Um, you know, it's why when all the scooters were introduced last year and everything, everything blew up, people were like, hold on, let like, do enough we wanna, tech. And en- like, do we want to go through all this bullshit again? Right. Right. And I think that, um, you know, I actually tweeted something at the time of like, you know, it might be interesting to actually talk about why people are having this reaction rather than just dismissing them as being haters. Um, and I think in the Lambda School thing, I think it has, it's a little knee jerk, but I think the fact that people are having this reaction means that those of us in the industry have to like think about. The fact that we do have to, you know, yeah, maybe it's time we, to be a little introspective. Yeah, exactly. Rather than just being like, well, they're just haters and like, you yeah, know, they're yeah. luddites. Like, hey, actually, maybe we have to do more to like, you know, earn people's trust and maybe have some more, put some more thought into the decisions we make because it's really easy for an entire industry to get tarnished by some bad actors, especially when the bad actors are the biggest companies in the industry. I, I've been saying this about Facebook since the beginning. I said, don't piss in the well that everybody has to drink from. Yeah. And you poison the well for the town, it is really bad. And you know, I remember when you, because you tweeted about Zuckerberg at Code. Yeah. And you remember, you told me the story. We're not going to say who it was, but a very prominent VC tried to end my career, said, don't speak out against Facebook. You're going to, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to screw this up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say who it is. It's somebody who's very big. It is, but it's a very high profile VC, literally emailed my VCs. You forwarded me the email. It was and CC them and said, "I am scathing. concerned about my because this person was an LP in that fund. Mm-hmm. I am concerned about my investment in your fund because of the behavior of your CEO Jason Calacanis criticizing Mark Zuckerberg." And it was like, "Oh well, I saw the email and I don't, you know, that's, I'm a that's fighter." That's a very Godfather. Uh, <laughs> I was like, Whoa. it had that vibe. Yeah, <laughs> it did. Yeah, and I, think, I remember this was in Jason Calacanis circa 2018 post yeah. Uber, you know, uh, investment. This is it's like 2010, OG, this, 2012, eight, nine, yeah. maybe yeah. 2008. It was like I wasn't. Yeah, I didn't have any power at that. Very little, let's say. And this was like the high profile. It was like in the scene with the Goodfellas where they're like, <laughs> Joe Pesci's going to get made, but they actually whack him, spoiler alert. And he's like, yeah. oh, I'm going to get made today. And he walks into the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on techs? Are, are you feeling the backlash when you're out there? Do you think there's... Um... I'm feeling a little bit of backlash. I'm feeling people be a little bit uncomfortable with the level of power that tech has now. Yeah. And, you know, certainly there is, I think underlying that is this fear of tech will take our jobs. And I think if we're able to to mitigate some of that concern, then the tide can turn. But let's take a like take a step back and remember when, you know, I've been in tech for a very long time. A couple um, of decades. <laughs> when you say a couple, it just means two. Right. right? We both we've been we've been in tech for a couple of decades. That's no, twenty years. No deal, just a couple of decades. <laughs> um, but remember when the people who were in tech were like 
the nerdiest people yeah. that you, you know, we were in our houses like on IRC at night. And now yeah. we're on the covers of magazines yeah. and we are, you know, driving the, the products that everyone uses. And mm-hmm. I think to have that one, to be able to manage that type of shift internally from mm-hmm. you being going from nerd to junk yeah. Yeah. is very difficult. Right. And then for the outs- for outside of that, for the general public to manage that kind of shift from you going from this nerd that they used to beat up on yeah. to now they're the person in power, the person who controls my job, the person yeah. who controls Revenge of the, nerds. The, the social media that I use every day. The election results. That's a really big shift on yeah. both sides of the table. Yeah. Well, I th- and I think also part of it is, you know, because I'm saying I, I got, you know, I think I started my first job in tech in 99. Uh, and... Um, I think for a lot of us, there was an assumption that the things we were doing were, you know, good in part because the businesses that were dominant at the time were not necessarily great companies, right? There like, were monopolies that abused you. Yeah. So and, it was like, oh, these guys are coming in and they're going to give us an option. We can have a voice. And on they're, the they're better yeah. for consumers. They're democratizing yeah. access. They're making information available, mm-hmm. like all this stuff. And, and I think that one of the things that was, I think, hardest to admit has changed is that. I think there was also a sense that the internet was this force that would keep companies in check right? in a way that like, there's only so much you could do because people would switch or, uh, uh, there was an alternative. There was always an alternative or, or, you know, that the internet was sort of this naturally democratizing force. And it turns out that, you know, you can get to a place where there are companies that are so powerful that almost become the internet themselves, whether it's Facebook or or Google. Uh, and that um, uh, I don't think anybody, I mean, honestly, 20 years ago, would you have thought the internet Not was going to be extent, no. dominated by really just a handful of companies? I just didn't, It feels weird. It just didn't seem right, you know? No, we were trying to- Didn't seem to, possible. Didn't seem possible, and it was like, we're going to have, you know, all of these other options. And now it's like, oh, Facebook and Google are 90% of the gain in advertising. Yep. Not the whole pie, but the gain all went to two companies. Mm-hmm. It does feel like those- do you think it's to the point where those companies need to be regulated, broken up, constrained? And this is a really difficult question for me. Yeah. I'm curious, Monique, what you think? Um, I'm not pro-regulation. Yeah. Um, I, I like a free market. Yeah. <laughs> um, and even even in the face of all the things that, that are happening with, with Facebook and with Google itself, I really think that I would like for the industry itself to regulate itself before yeah. we get to the point where people who don't understand how ads work have to regulate it for us. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that would put us in a much worse position, a worse position where innovation does, doesn't happen anymore. Mm. So I'm not pro-regulation. Yeah. What do you think, Peter? I am more comfortable with regulation in theory. I think that I don't necessarily have a lot of faith in the government that we have right now uh, being able to execute. <laughs> yeah, I was when I was thinking about government uh, so, regulation, I was excluding the yeah. current so, president uh, from you know, I, th- I think we have to be sort of, of there's years. a pragmatic answer and a uh, optimistic answer maybe, but yeah. but I, I I do think that um you know my feeling is that you know the regulatory structures of some kind do create a level playing field mm-hmm. ideally for competition and sometimes can help foster competition. Mm-hmm. So I'm not necessarily on the I'm not a libertarian in the sense of like you know, any kind of... Anything goes. Yeah. I actually, you know, I, I would prefer to have a uh, very smart regulation or thinking about uh, what is going to foster better outcomes overall. And that's very, very difficult. But there are examples of markets that have done better with, uh, you know, uh, with more regulation than with less. Um, and, I, and I think that it's important to... Um, the thing I worry about is that, you know, companies should be in the business of making money. I think when we say to them, well, you have to also sort of voluntarily limit what you do f- to serve these sort of moral ends, um, it becomes this kind of prisoner's dilemma where it's like, well, if I do it and this other com- competitor doesn't, I'm going to lose and I'll be out of business. Right. It's like, and so I'd rather be like, you know what, that's just the playing field. And like everyone yeah. has to, you know, set this, meet this baseline. And, uh, you know, and I, it, to me, it's like around food safety, right? It's like, which is apparently not happening right now because the government shut down. But, um, but you know, I don't think Enjoy any your of us, broccoli, everybody. Yeah, I don't think any of us feel like we're worse off because the USDA is inspecting food and making sure that our food supply is safe. Uh, and I think that, you know, the alternative, which would be some sort of voluntary system of, 
you know, compliance might be much worse in terms of, you know, consumer health and safety than yeah. what we have now. The thing that always concerns me about this regulation, too, is, well, it's going to be misapplied, obviously, because people don't know what they're talking about and tech yep. moves so fast. And yeah. the people on the tech side have more resources and whatever regulation you put there, they're going to route around. And then do we are not operating in a vacuum. There is a global competitive marketplace here that we have dominated. The fact that this little 300 million person country is some massive you know, percentage of G global GDP is miraculous. The fact that Uber, Airbnb, Lyft, Google, Facebook, Instagram are global phenomenons means something for America. It means like we're leading the world. If we start handicapping our own people, well, this could mean our standard of living and the country's well-being could go down too. Yeah, but I'd argue that we had we have had that level of innovation in part because of you know cultural factors, um, our openness and immigration, which maybe is changing. Uh, the fact that we had a you know a world class education system, which again may be changing. Uh, <laughs> and so um, you know I, I would say that you know if I had to take sort of the the Trumpian approach, which seems to be happening right now, of you know discouraging diversity and discouraging innovation and discouraging immigration and um, telling people that, you know, if you're a PhD candidate from, you know, a developing country, you know, don't come here. Yeah. Um, those are the things that are going to hurt us more in the long run than I, like what, whether or not there are certain kinds of regulation. I had a company here today and they were talking about being in Vancouver and they had people from Brazil who were developers and they wanted to bring them. You know, and obviously the coming to America is out of the question or very difficult. Two weeks to get their paperwork done. Yeah. And they're on the ground in Vancouver working. So yeah. my cousin Diego, he is a front end developer, was uh, went to UT, uh, you know, on a student visa and then got an H-1B uh, to work for a company, a, a soft, you know, doing software development. The company was acquired. They decided to lay off all the engineers, which is kind of crazy to me, but they did. And his, he had like six weeks to find a new job under his, you know. And That's his, the, you want to talk about indentured servitude and the reaction to the uh, Lambda school piece. That's the real indentured servitude. The H-1B, they, they get all these Indian people, or, or I think a large percentage of it, uh, from what I understand. And they tell them like, they scare the bejesus up, bring your family here. And you, if we cut you and you don't work these hours and you don't work for this low pay, you got six weeks to get a job or get out of the country. They're all getting hired for IT jobs, which Americans are perfectly capable of doing. So the H-1B thing is like this. I don't know if you've had an H-1B conversation in a company that you're on the board of or something like mm -hmm. that. Yep. But almost universally, when I somebody talks about H-1B, H-1B, visas, whatever, the conversation starts with how much money are we going to save mm -hmm. on this person? Which kind of was Trump's point about it was, yeah, you know, is this being used as a hack to like get lower salaries? Did, was the conversation around saving money? For why is company? Oh uh, no, when people were hiring H one B. No, it was actually we have someone awesome we want to hire. Got it. Okay, and, yeah. uh, so I think that does happen, obviously. Yeah, too, it's but. like now it's impossible to get a visa for them. Got it. And and so I think that it cuts both ways. Yeah. You know, I think in the long run, I think I'd rather have a more open economy where we're able to bring the, <laughs> the, the best people here, yeah. uh, even if it requires, you know, us to also take some people that are going to, you know, dampen pay a little bit, um, yeah. you know, or, or might like commit a crime at some point in the future. It's like, really? Like you're going to, I mean, if you know, I, I, I mean, are we going to kick out all the people who are American citizens who <laughs> exactly, yeah, right? exactly? I mean, look, my father was a doctor. He came here from South America, right? right? Did he steal a job from an American doctor? I mean, in theory, I guess, you know. Um, yeah, but it, it's well, was the economy growing? We needed more doctors, you know. But and he like, was a good doctor. You know, yeah, but you know, I, I do you know is America like worse off because like you know people like me were you know born because he was able to come? Yeah, here, I mean, we'd know? have no Sergey, no Elon. No uh, rule off. Like there's a lot of people who came from all around the world to come here, and but I, and what I worry about is that the climate is changing where people don't want. Like, why would you want to come to this country if like people are going to yeah. be so hostile to you? <sighs> like you have now you have choices. You know, on, honestly, I think um, you know countries which are uh, Europe is looking good. Well, and and I think that smart countries that are smart are going to realize that being open. Canada, to Can yeah, Canada. Um, are you seeing a lot of Canadian companies not too? Um, I'm seeing a fair amount of Canadian companies. More, yeah. I mean, I, I saw a bunch at 500 and, mm. you know, I have a lot of friends who are Canadian investors and so I see a lot. Yeah. And the AI scene in Canada is booming. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it localized in one area? Is it all uh, the Ottawa? Yeah. 
the whole Waterloo. Area oh yeah, Waterloo University, University is legit. Yeah. yeah, we see a lot of AI related stuff coming out. We of We have an office vision. in Toronto now. Nice. We have three people in our Toronto office. Canadian dollar, Toronto, seventy five cents on the dollar, or something like that. And there's a ton of talented people there, and the cost of living is one third. Yeah. Of San Francisco. And, and they're in, I mean, the, the government there is investing in education and research around AI, which is, you know, they're trying to really foster an ecosystem there. And they, oh, they they'll see, give you credits too, yeah. tax credits. Yeah. At the end of the year, you file, and I think you get either a 75% or 100% back on some developer positions. When we get back, I want to talk a little bit more about CES, look at that bread baking video, and talk about sex tech being uh, kicked out of CES when we get back on This Week in Startups. It's time for you to turn your idea into a new website, maybe a blog, or you want to publish content, sell products and services of any kind, including, hey, launchfestivalsydney.com happening June 18th and 19th. We made this gorgeous website with, you guessed it, Squarespace, where you can promote your physical or online business and announce an event like we just did, or have any of your special projects up and running in minutes with beautiful customizable templates that are built by world-class designers and that are optimized for mobile. I always tell everybody on my team, look at it on your phone, then your tablet, then your desktop. And Squarespace is beautifully optimized for each. You can buy domains and choose from over 200 extensions, built-in analytics, built-in search engine optimization. It's free and secure hosting with 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week award-winning customer support. We use it. We love it. Go to angel.university. Go to founder.university. Go to Launch Festival Sydney. We love Squarespace because it's beautiful and easy to use. And if you're going to set up an e-commerce site, they put in all that e-commerce functionality. Every week of every year for the last decade, they add more features to squarespace.com and you, the uh, customer of Squarespace, benefit. Every week, there is strength in numbers and they just make that software better and better and better and you just become the beneficiary of that constant innovation by the Squarespace team. So when you go to squarespace.com and start a free trial, when you're gonna launch, use the offer code TWIST and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I know that you don't need the 10% off, but please, Use the twist code and go ahead and thank at Squarespace. Say thank you at Squarespace for supporting This Week in Startups. Go ahead and do that uh, on your Twitter. It really means a lot to you. I'll follow you back. Okay. Thanks again to our friends at Squarespace. We love and use your product every day. Well done. All right. Let me see this bread baking video because uh, my friend Mark Pesci was talking about the bread baking robot. I'm obsessed with it because Cafe X, oh, I'm so proud of this investment. We have three locations. Here we go. Let's hit play. I see a bunch of bread on racks. Okay, that doesn't seem particularly amazing. Uh, you stick your hands inside the robot and why doesn't it put it in a bag for you? You just have to grab a raw loaf of bread that's not even sliced yet? All right, so here it goes. It's filling a, a beaker with flour. Apparently all natural flour. Oh, there's the dough. It goes by. You watch the dough get pressed. Okay, this is kind of dope, actually. See, this is where I think for these machines to really work, you have to see it happening. Yeah. That's the magic of it. It dumps the bread into a, a little baking tray, but that's how they work in a factory. Oh, and then here it is. The robot arm is placing it. Okay, that's a little bit of automation. Not much. Wait, this is kind of janky, I'll be honest. I'm not impressed. That They need to slice it. You need to be able to pick <laughs> the length, the thickness of your slice, and it needs to put it in a sleeve for you. You don't stick your hand in the middle of the machine with a robot arm there. You get chopped <laughs> off. But... Uh, Cafe X, just a tutor on horn here. They went from just being like espresso-based beverages, then they added the tap, then they added ice, and they put an ice machine in, and now they do iced beverages, and then there's a couple of other things they're adding that are obvious that happen at Starbucks that represent the other half of the counter, and like they just keep adding features. And Henry, God love him, the CEO, every time he adds a feature, yeah. the revenue goes up 20%. Revenue goes up 15%. And we're like, oh my God, this robot can do anything. <laughs> and that was my original premises, but it has to do it 100%. Um, and then at CES, has anybody seen any of the other robot kind of automated food or anything or used any of the other stuff? There's that burger place. They're open like three hours a day. I haven't gone to it yet. I haven't gone to it. There's also Zoom Pizza, which started as pizza. They just raised yeah. that big soft bank round a little yeah. bit ago. Yeah, that's um, like 30% automated. I know those guys. I yeah. checked it out. Pizza was okay. And the hamburger joint, it's like they 
there's like a salad one now. I think we went through YC. All of them are like 30, 40% automated, yeah. which to me, it doesn't really make much sense because you don't gain all that much, mm-hmm. you know? But what I did notice, I went to Panera. Have you guys been to a Panera Bread? Not. No. No, I've been to a Panera Bread because I was like driving back from years. Truckee. Yeah. I, I've never been to one. Yeah. Lovely places. I mean, they're very accommodating. Four or five kiosks in the... Uh, and they still have a person work in the register, but there were kiosks there. And people were going to the kiosk For the ordering? For the ordering. Oh, yeah. I'd prefer like to order McDonald's, from the kiosk. Yeah. Well, you, you, Doesn't McDonald's do that also? I think McDonald's now is forcing you to do it yeah. in some places. Like to have one person, you get like penalized. It's sort of like using cash at a toll booth. They're like, we're going to make this painful. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. There were some sex, tech, toys, whatever. Um, and CES revoked an award from a female founded sex tech company. It seems kind of weird. It does seem weird. So the company is called Laura DiCarlo, yeah. and they won an innovation award at CES. And CES um, subsequently revoked the award and then kicked out the founder of the company. Who's which, female. Who is, who is a woman founder. Yeah. Um, which seems a little ridiculous. Uh, first of all, CES used to have a really cozy relationship with the adult entertainment awards that happen at the same time. Yeah, the AVNs occur, yeah. Right, they used to have happen at the exact same time. I think so, it's like a little bit of overlap now. They come after, right? I always remember when I was leaving CES, they were coming in and it was like, whoa, the lobby's got a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you can always tell the two groups. Let yes, me just leave it at that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there was definitely sort of this cozy relationship where yeah. innovation happens in the adult entertainment space and it also happens at CES. Yeah. Um, I think this sort of weird hard line that they're putting with not allowing a, what is essentially a vibrator company to yeah. win an innovation award is a little ridiculous because that is often where a lot of really good innovation starts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, broadband and like computers themselves, CD-ROM, all of these things, mobile. Beta to v- Betamax to VHS. Yeah, Betamax, like VHS, LaserDisc. Like, what, what do you think is driving? Streaming, payments online. I, I just understand how... They got through the process and were selected for an award and then retroactively, yeah. like that's a, look, I mean, I can understand any business has the right to sort of be like, these are our standards and like this is the yeah. stuff that we're, inclu-, you know. Because maybe they have kids on the floor or, of the show or maybe they put in a separate area yeah. so you have to opt but, in. But I mean, but to to have them go through the process. And then revoke it. And then get an award but and then to pull it. This is a porn company. This no, 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 like, no. But I'm saying, but like, but that, that's what makes it like especially yeah. egregious where it's like, you know, like, like you know, if it was so out of bounds, then just don't even consider it in the first. When place. did you wake up to the point that this yeah, was that, all of a sudden? That, you know, just seems yeah. like that remarkable, was the line. Just seems remarkably unprofessional to me. So um, I think there's this bigger issue of um, the technology industry not really recognizing women focused se- women focused products and sex tech in particular yeah. as worthy of funding, acknowledgement, awards, yeah. where there's actually some really innovative stuff happening in this category. I'm an investor in O.Dot School, Andrea Barica's company. Yeah. Um, it's basically helping women um, get better educated about sex through streaming video, um, streaming infotainment style video. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really difficult for those types of founders to grow a business, mm. which is a legitimate business that serves a part of the market. Um, and it's often very these very female focused kinds of businesses that don't get the recognition. Meanwhile, Hims has raised a huge ton of money, yeah. and it's all about erectile yeah. dysfunction. Yeah. Guys, if you can't get an erection, let's go. Right. Yeah. Um, and I love the no company problem. Hims. I love yeah. the company, but I think if we're going to be say that company is okay, but that women's like a sex bit of a is double, not. Yeah. It's a no, huge it's double absolutely, standard. Yeah, absolutely double standard. Absolutely double standard. Well, but, one of the great. Uh, moments in our accelerator the launch accelerator was we accepted a company which had the most revenue of any company previous to getting into the incubator panty prop oh yeah and they create underwear and uh bathing suits etc for the menstrual cycle uh and for especially for young women who are going through for the first time to build confidence and deal with leakage and all this kind of stuff and i just sat there after we accepted them and watched the pitch and you know you know it's the venture community is largely male and we're you know whatever it is 90 percent male and i'm watching the front row and i'm just watching her pitch and it's so great because she's talking about menstruation <laughs> in a very detailed passionate way and i'm watching the front row and i'm just watching them get a little comfortable and then all of a sudden they see the revenue numbers and then they're like okay which one's your favorite and like you got guys who really couldn't even 
sit through the conversation of menstruation than saying, I want to invest in the company. Mm-hmm. It was like a great kind of, well, you, did you sit through the panty prop? Uh, no, I missed You that missed one. panty prop. Yeah. In a, yeah. There's they, one class that I missed. That was it. You missed yeah. the, and they're doing fantastic. I mean, they're printing money and they built it all off a nickel, like without yeah. much investment or any. But you see those companies sort of struggle to, to raise money at yeah. the very outset. Um, and then you also take a look at you know breast pump companies and yeah. um, other breast things milk, that have to do, do with uh, yeah. female sexuality or just things that happen to women yeah. like menstruation. Yeah. Um, and you see that they're not getting the same level of funding and support as these other companies where you can you know you can sell erectile dysfunction pills and yeah and get know, funded like crazy and get funded like crazy guys are like oh i get to keep my hair and get an erection right. let's go <laughs> yes. and it's like oh I, i've got to like i understand that problem right yeah um and i think that's uh, that's the breakdown of not having enough women on the other side of the table. Even though we've, sure. we've gotten a lot better over the last year, year and a half, two years. It's been amazing the turnaround the last two years. For sure. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm interested to see where that will go because I think the, the volume has decreased a little bit. Um, people ha- not having enough women in their shops, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I still think the, the issue remains where there, are not, there aren't enough women on the other side of the table writing those checks yeah. and talking about breast pumps and talking about um, you know, other types of sex yeah. tech. How's it changed for you? You were so early. I mean, you've been investing for how many years now? Um, so I just started invest. I was an entrepreneur first. Yeah. Well, I was an entrepreneur first, then I was in product. And, you know, now I'm on the investor side of the table for the last four years. Yeah. But even four years ago, you were yeah. a pioneer when you would say like, I'm a venture capitalist. But like, oh, a black woman venture capitalist. So You're like I tell one of story. two, right? So occasionally I end up in, in pla- I'm not going to tell you where I go because yeah. then it'll ruin it. Yeah. Um, I end up in these places where lots of VCs congregate yeah. and I'll sit down at the bar and I will hear a completely inappropriate for me to be hearing conversation oh because they don't think I'm a VC. They're just assuming they're just like, They're just assuming. They're like, oh, she's just, she, I don't know. She's yeah, whatever. Fashion, marketing. Yeah, marketing. Yeah, she's in marketing. PR. Fashion. She's in PR. She's in PR. Uh, and then I'm hearing very salient deal points. <laughs> I'm always amazed at, I, I literally had to tell somebody on a Southwest flight who was talking about a company I knew hmm. was a VC. I didn't know him. And he's literally talking about the deal terms during you know, taxing on the runway, people putting their bags in and stuff like that. And I just tapped him on the shoulder while he was on the phone. He's like, I'm on the phone. I was like, I know that company. And he's like, you're Jason Calacanis. I was like, yes, I may not want to talk about this. I like, oh, thank you, thank you. And then afterwards he's like, oh, you know them? Oh, okay, yeah, no, we're, we're doing a deal. Do you want to be on a deal? But I was just like, dude, like, oh my God. you're on the phone talking yeah. about the employee stock. I mean, just every yeah. possible, uh, detail in the um it was crazy hey half the internet is fake all the metrics are bogus <laughs> there are click farms everywhere fake businesses fake content deep fakes counterfeit reality as we talked about obviously politics has been overrun with fake accounts the stuff that's coming out of the facebook russian investigation is getting dark and insane um and we are all part of this this dopamine dopamine feedback loop 60% of the web traffic is human or less than 60%. What do you think all this means for the ad industry, Peter? Well, I can tell you having, uh, when I was at AOL, actually, um, one of the things I, I worked on was, um, you know, how the ad blocker issue. Yeah. Um, but also the flip side of that is that the ad fraud. Uh, uh, and what will happen is, um, you know, legitimate publishers will have an issue with their, uh, Companies which are um, run these sort of, you know, will run advertisements, uh, and then um, uh, they'll have fake traffic to click through. So a publisher, so like an the, Engadget, for example. We're not saying this happened at Engadget, but so, so it's not the publisher that's that's doing it. The so publisher Engadget is not clicking on the ads to get money. No, the person who runs the ad network. Yes. is sending a click farm against it to hit the Samsung ads, so I'd get, say. Yeah, so they get paid by the advertisers. Because they get a percentage of it. Exactly. And what oh, happens is so for, dirty. And the thing is, a lot of these networks, there are so many kind of layers, and you know, so somebody gets, a, there's so many different layers where somebody will get a cut, and so it creates a lot of player, a lot of actors who have an incentive to it's participate so in opaque. The, the click fraud. Right. Um, you know, but you also see, you do see, I will say, on YouTube, uh, a lot of uh, content producers who are using um, you know, Fiverr or whatever, content farms. To, 
I mean, did you see there was a um, uh, an article about these, you know, uh, video view farms in China, and it was like people with like dozens of phones on like racks, and they just go and they're just like clicking. You know, and they're all connected to like VPN, so they, it looks like it's all real traffic, <gasps> and um, and they'll just sit there and just like, you know, like add views. Yeah, I wish I should have I should have sent the link over. I know it's, I have seen amazing. that photo. Yeah, it's there's, amazing. I, and it looks like the room where I remember in the early days of Gowal or Foursquare, everybody who was doing mobile apps in the early days would have an Android room yep. where they'd have twenty different Android phones in a rack, nice and and you download the app, so you could just see your app in the real world on every Samsung Motorola phone, but this is a whole, but. Well, look, I mean, the reality is that. Oh my God, here it is. is. Yeah, that. Oh my Lord, that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So that is a giant click farm. Yep. And people have a wall of monitors. Those are giant monitors. Those are the phones, that's the wall Those of phones. Those are the phones, yeah. The other one is just look monitors that, which that. simulate, oh my Lord. Yeah. And they have some sort of control over those phones and they just send a thousand views to your video for five dollars. Yeah, that's what happens. And, I, and that's I, where Fiverr happens. That's where a lot of this stuff happens, right? And yeah. I think that the reality is that, um, you know, anytime we set up a, an incentive structure, people are going to follow the incentive structure. I mean, that's just what it is. And so, if like you're going to create a system where, you know, if you get you get paid by how much traffic you can send, you can ac- accumulate, um, then people are going to you know, play that game. I mean, you look at like Instagram influencers and it's a huge problem now where the, uh, a lot of people are, have such fake numbers of followers and things like that. And they use it to, you know, to go and sell, get sponsored content, uh, you know, content sponsorships and things like that. Does it matter because when you get the end of the day, because most advertising is an auction and people are basing it on cost per action. Right. The actual conversion at the end. Did I sell my Dollar Shave Club? Did I sell my panty prop? Whatever. Does it actually matter at the end? Because they're going to be just looking at the from net, an investor net point of view. I think it mat- It definitely matters, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you're evaluating, let's say you're evaluating a media uh, company, <laughs> the traffic matters. Yeah. Um, the but the question is, what do you? What can we do about it at this point? Yeah. The genie is sort of out of the bottle, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the. the um, you know, I, I would say that the political stuff is the stuff that bothers me the most. I think because, uh-huh. um, I mean, to take it away from U.S. politics, but you look at like Brexit, for example. It turns out that a lot of people thought that Brexit was much more popular than it really was yeah. because of bots, and so it did influence people's perception of of you know. It, it, you can, we all know that you know if you go to watch a movie and other people are laughing, you're more inclined to laugh. Of course. And so it's the same thing. People's perception yeah, social of pressure. something, social pressure, social proof. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, this is again what the Russians were so masterful at was figuring out how to make it something seem like real, real or like a when bigger deal than it, yeah. when it wasn't. Yeah. And that was absolutely kind of terrifying. Well, and the yeah. most nefarious part of it was they went after Obama voters and they specifically tried to subvert the African-American vote. Exactly. Suppression, you have yeah. all of these, you know, fake African-American accounts, um, oh. especially on Twitter, where they've been exposed to like not be actual real people, but right. be based on based in Russia. And so and then that sort of drives this sort of this conversation of unrest between the races, which I yeah. think, you know, the current party <laughs> yeah, used to its benefit. Yeah, I mean the I, that whole tiki torch madness. I yeah. forgot what city that was in. Charlottesville. Charlottesville. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it, was that set up by the Russians as well? Where they were like, we're having. A, it was not set up, but it was stoked counter, by was the Russians. Stoked, but there was an example of an event in Texas, which was set up by Russians. It, by the Russians, where it was, I think a um, like a Sharia. It was like a like a pro Sharia law thing, and then pro- and then they organized the anti Sharia law protest, yeah. and all pe- people showed up, yeah. thinking crazy. that they were gonna like you know beat up some Muslims or something like that. It was like oh, absolutely insane. Lord. World has gone bonkers. But it's an interesting use of like another yeah, entity right yeah. pulling the strings. Of things that were already inherently yes. there in the American culture, yeah, under right? and it was like simmering or very low heat, mm-hmm. and they're just like, oh, and they're like, oh, we see that. Yeah. Let's let's amp- let's put the heat up a little bit. On yeah, that. let's turn it <laughs> up. Yeah, I mean, I think, put some kerosene on it. I mean, I think if you have if you are a racist, right, and um, you know, before you might have been you know realized like Quiet. I got to keep a lid on this. Yeah, um, 
I think once it becomes sort of more social, if you bot, once bots made it more socially acceptable in your right. view, you're like, okay, like everybody else is doing this. Like, right. I yeah, I might well. as well go out with my Confederate flag yeah. and yeah. protect the Confederate um, statues. Which is just, I, I mean, it's just, it's just wild to me, you know? And like, look, I mean, you know, my father from South America, he, he encountered a, a fair amount of prejudice, right? right. It, um, but I always felt like the world was definitely like moving in the right direction for a long time. And, and it probably was, they're just taking this thing that was on the decline and then stroking it. In a way, it's kind of genius in that now we know who the real racists are. Like all of these like yes crazy. And I, I, yes and no. I mean, I think it's racist obviously people better for it empowered. to be exposed, but I think it also, um, I, I think one way to make racism go away, ideally, is to make it socially unacceptable to be racist, right? Yeah. It's just the same thing like with homophobia, right? It became, is now socially unacceptable to be homophobic. And that's how we, you know, yeah, this is how you make this stuff go away, and that's the part that like is so f- frustrating is because now we have like to we have to get the not we have to we I have don't to think go it ever goes away though because I just mean, bias is just but inherent. you know what I'm saying, but you know what yeah. I'm saying though like, like the way that you make life livable for people at least right. is that, like you have to is to make the racist people be incredibly underground exactly and afraid to make to, them like pariahs right yeah. To, yeah make it clear that, like if you behave in this way you are going to be excluded from society basically yeah and I think that if that is not the case. That is a real problem, and and that's why, like you know, one of the things I've well been, now we see, also see that a racist can be president. So I, I know, <laughs> but one of the things that I, I I've been that is I found really useful is when people say to substitute the word political correctness for social acceptability, that phrase. And so when people are like, oh, I hate like political correctness, blah blah blah, and I'm like, look, actually swap that out and put socially acceptable or social acceptable. Yeah. And, and if you realize, well, it's just not socially acceptable to make like a gay joke anymore yeah no that's not political you can call that political correctness but it's really about what is socially acceptable now and to me we always have a line and we can argue over where the line is but there's never not a line i like the fact that there's an ongoing discussion at least even in the aftermath of all this chaos that like ellen and kevin hart can have like a productive discussion about their don lemon then i don't know if you saw his clip where he talked about it as a gay black man yeah and his reaction to kevin hart and like I, I just wish we could all just talk to each other about the issues and social media is the worst place for that to occur because the bots are there and then people are so easy to misinterpret. But I don't know. I, How I do you feel? The, is it getting better, you think? Uh, no. 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 Um, I've decreased my time on <laughs> some platforms. <laughs> well, you're, uh, you're a target as a woman. Right. And as a woman of color. And as a woman of color as well. You right. Know, does it make just social media is just hard to use? You know, I've been really lucky in that I don't think people um, target me in the way that they might some other people. Yeah. Um, people have been, you know, they just generally let me say whatever I want, and yeah. and you know, I don't I don't get harassed in the way that I've seen other women get harassed. But I do think, um, you know, social networks have have a have to play a part in in moderating the conversation. Um, I'm not all about rules but you know if people are harassing women on your platform then you should probably do something about that and you should probably put some controls in place that yeah. make women feel women and people of color feel safer on your platform that's a, twitter just seems like this anonymity on twitter was a mistake that's a hard yeah. problem to solve now and no i mean right. how do you put it yeah. i have a solution to it which is everybody can get the blue check mark not just journalists or famous vc C's, excuse me. If if you could opt in, put your credit card in, pay ten bucks to get verified. I know a lot of Twitter people would be like, ten bucks, yeah, I want the blue check mark. Then slowly you have the entire uh, user base moves to blue check marks, which means it's your name verified in a database or on a credit card. Then all the other accounts at some point, see what people are you blue check marked? I'm not blue check. Are you blue check marked? Yeah. As a journalist, we got in pretty early because that's what they they used it originally for journalists and celebrities. Mm-hmm two different things because people would create fake journalist accounts and then spread yeah. or fake, yeah. you know, and people didn't know the difference. I had fake, I had like, I've, I had yeah. parody accounts. I had parody accounts yeah. and people, I think it's like real Calacanis is a parody account and people to this day interact <laughs> with it and nobody can create a parody of my account because my account is a parody already. <laughs> like the real account is going to say it's crazier shit that any yeah. <laughs> parody account can come up with. Come on. But um, what, when you have the blue check mark, you have a, a stream called verified on your replies. So you have all your activity at mentions, and then you have verified. Do you start with verified and work backwards like I do? 
on your stream? I, I just have the stream. I, you I, just I, go to the full stream. I use tweet bottom like and tweet deck. Uh, I'm like pure reverse chronological. Yeah, but I'm talking about replies. See, you can sort your replies. I probably get in fewer replies than you do. So okay, I get a lot of replies, but yeah. you can get verified and then everybody else. So I get so many replies that I start with verified. I go through like, okay, here's a celebrity, verified journalist, whatever. I, I got to make sure I see every of their responses because they're verified. Then I go to everybody else and then there's a lot of like trolls. Yeah. I mean. Okay. To, well, to that idea, yeah. what if you live in a country where it's not safe to have your real name attached to yeah. something that you might be saying? That like is Like where wrong. freedom of speech is just yeah. inherently yeah. not something that you are able to have. It's such a good point. You know, or think, just the logistics of having a credit card. Some countries, uh, credit that card was, that was just not. That was like the whole Egypt revolution yeah. kind of thing, revolution that occurred there, which was, that's what Twitter kept pointing to. It's like, we're helping coordinate this stuff. But I'm thinking the downside's greater than the upside, but at least they could start with America. Mm. And say, you know, here's the verification process, like driver's license or credit card or whatever. And it costs 10 bucks or something. Yeah, I think it's uh, too late. I, my sense is they've looked at things like that. And, and you know, there are other things you could do where, you know, if someone who's verified can verify somebody else. But if yeah. that person that you verify gets kicked off, you also get kicked off. So oh. there's like a, you know, a so, penalty. So yeah, so there's a real penalty where it's like, don't, mm. ver, vow, don't, if you, you're vouching for this person and you will lose access to the platform if this person becomes a bad actor. Yeah. Um, it's just tricky to, it's just tricky to involve, you know, to, to do. And, and it's hard to, I had an idea for social network. Let me see what you guys think of this. Guaranteed privacy. We don't store your data. Like we don't store you, when you opened it, your IP address, your location, none of that. We don't store it. Second, um, it's ad free. And here's how it works. You can buy into the system for $100 for your lifetime and invite 99 other people. It's like a dollar a person. Mm -hmm. And then over some period of time, after it hits critical mass, you know, the let's say the millionth person, it becomes a, you know, $10 for life you know the 10 millionth person it's a hundred dollars for life or you know five bucks a year some way to make it somewhat free where like people who have money like the three of us could buy in for a hundred bucks for the year and invite 99 other people who we think are considered so we're like okay yeah we want to have a social network that is got these things and you, what could the infrastructure cost for a facebook like service not that much i mean actually, and then you put in a marquee kind of ad like you know if you use the free version and you were invited there's just an ad that's generic like it's a united states ad for a movie that's it and there's one ad per day or something why isn't it a, just like a metered developer product right where you can build whatever front end. You, it's an identity and you have the friends and the followers and all that stuff. i don't know because it, it, twitter, i think it twitter has thought about twitter consider going down that path really right? which is you would the, the, you would have all these clients and you could have a client that had ads you could have yeah. a client that was paid um, mm -hmm. And the developer paid, you know, by the, uh, you know, meter yeah, that's API another way calls. To do it. Yeah, let the best client win. I just think there's some other model out there that somebody's missing. Yeah, where you just pay a certain amount, and then, you know, the first hundred people to the network invite a hundred people each. It's almost like PageRank. You know, like Google's like, here are the websites that matter. If they link to something, like NASA's not going to link to something, you know, or New York Times, in all likelihood, is not going to link to something that's low credibility. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think we'll we'll see some evolution and experimentation there, um, just in the same way that it took us a long time to get to where we are with, you know, people paying and subscribing to, you know, media services mm -hmm. and things like that. I mean, it, it, it took a long time to get to the place where, um, you know, you could think about, like, charging for your newsletter and, you yeah. know, things like that. So I do think we're well overdue for a new social network. So I know. It's about time. There was a social network that I used to like. I won't say the name of it, but it was popular amongst our group. And I reached out to the person who bought it and shut it down. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Four letter domain yes. name. And I was like, hey, do you want to sell that domain name? <laughs> I'm in discussions. I don't think okay. it'll happen. But I always had affinity for that one. Yeah, I was a big fan also. Uh, Walker & Co. got bought. They did. That's a big deal. They did, Procter & Gamble. Um, uh, Do we know what the I, I don't think it was is? a huge outcome for oh, okay. investors. But I do think it's interesting that a, a large brand bought them. 
Yeah. And today, Tristan announced a new product line, which is that Be- that Bevel and Walker and Co is expanding into skincare. Oh, and wow. I think they wouldn't have been able to do this without that sale to PNG. Yeah, because you either have to raise a ton of money, like like a Hims level mm-hmm. of money, um, in order to do it yourself, or yeah. you have to have the back the balance sheet of a big brand like yeah. Procter and Gamble or Unilever behind you. Um, you know, part of me is certainly a little sad that, that he yeah. wasn't able to take it all the way himself, um, Tristan and, and the Bell team. Uh, but Were I you an investor or? No. Just friends? Yeah. 500 was. Oh, 500 was. Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we had him on the podcast. It seems like they definitely found a market, but man, direct-to-consumer, that requires now a, a war chest. It's expensive now. It does require a war chest. And I think, yeah. you know, Tristan came out at a time when there was very little venture capital going to founders of color. Um, yeah. and like even less than what was than it now. five years ago he started? Uh, I think five or six. Yeah, roughly five, six years. Yeah. 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 I think he'll wind up becoming a venture capitalist. And I think, you know, trying to build a war chest at that time with, with that kind of um you know, industry biases that yeah. that occurred. You know, you walk in and you're talking about Walker & Co. and you're talking about building what is basically the African-American PNG. I think then it was a really difficult, um, it was a really difficult sell. Hmm. I think also the tech investors were less uh, open to kind of package, investing in like yeah. d- direct to consumer packaged goods. And I think they, they had trouble seeing as much of the opportunity as it's now, it's definitely more obvious now. I couldn't see it with Dollar Shave Club. The The founder of Dollar Shave Club followed me into the parking lot uh, after a speaking gig. And he's like, ah, I'm a big fan. I was like, oh, thanks for that. I can take a selfie, whatever, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I'm doing this thing, Dollar Shave Club. Here's the thing. The blades are un- no longer under patent. I could email them to you. I could mail them to you for a dollar because they come to the thing and then you buy it on a subscription and you don't have to go through. I was like, listen, kid, let me stop. Right <laughs> this is not software. This is not venture scale business. And he's like, no, but you don't understand. You, you can take it and you don't have to have any retail and then it's so high margin that if you get it on a subscription, I was like, kid, you don't understand. Let me explain it to you one more time. This is not software. This is a shitty business. And literally, it was probably an under $10 million valuation. It was certainly under $10 million. Yeah. I could have bought 5% of the company there. It would have been a 50 million goddamn outcome. Yeah. And that's where I came up with the rule, never underestimate anyone. Yeah. And don't try to understand the product. Could you, we're all so limited in our ability to know what's going to work. You have to put it out there in the world and see if it's going to work. Yeah. yeah. Bread breaking robot? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I would have gone bagel. You get a bagel robot out there, huh? That's a whole different yeah. ball game. All right, this has been an amazing episode. Great show, everybody. Uh, if you want money for your startup, follow Monique Woodward on the Twitter or Peter Rojas. I said Woodward. Oh, he said Woodward? Sorry about that. Woodard. <laughs> I, I inserted another W. I'm giving you extra credit. Because uh, you're such a winner. Okay, because we're all going to be winning so much. I mean, how does it end? It's ending, right? Like, Manafort yesterday, for people who are watching this 100 years from now <laughs> and wondering why we're not talking about Nixon right now, is it? <laughs> Manafort yeah. was giving polling data to the Russians? <laughs> yeah. That... And we're still wondering if it's collusion? Like, what has to happen? Do we have to have, like, a videotape? We may have to. Him yeah. handing over with like a smile and a thumbs up saying like, this is treason. It's treason. So Hang the guy. Have you listened to Bagman, the podcast about Spiro Agnew? No. So it's Rachel This is Ma- Major Maddow. Rachel, Rachel Maddow. Maddo. And uh, so- That's my girl. I, you know, oh, I had man. listened to um, Slow Burn, which is the one that, yes. that Slate did about- um, I heard that's great. About Nixon and now doing about Clinton. I can't listen to uh, this. It's too anxiety producing. I can't listen to the Clinton one. Um, but uh, <laughs> the uh, but it was interesting. So how I, there was so little I didn't know about Spiro Agnew yeah. and like what happened. I was like, oh, he's got like tax evasion or something. Mm-hmm. And right. He's but, the guy who flipped. No, 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 no. He was taking bribes in the White House. What? He had been so he'd been part of a bribery scandal when he was governor of Mar- or governor of Maryland, oh. and then he became vice president. And then they actually flipped the bag man, the guy who was bringing him oh. bags, bags of, of cash, cash wow. bag to the cash? White House. Huh. And so they got him, and then they. Re- but the thing is, the this there were these federal prosecutors in Maryland who were you know on the case, and they realized, okay, Nixon may 
get impeached and resign at any moment. And then this guy's going to be president. <gasps> we got to get him before he becomes president and shuts down the shuts shuts us all down. Wow. Because we're like, this guy's like, we know, like Nixon's bad, but this guy's maybe it's even whole worse. Level. This guy's brown bagging it. Yeah. And so, um, and not, I mean, spoiler I guess spoiler. Yeah. Okay. But, <laughs> it's whatever, it's okay. so the, the, but what happened was the prosecutors, basically the, 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 Depart- the Japanese Department majority. of Justice, <laughs> they, yeah, they actually went to him and they're like, look, we're going to indict you. And he's like, you can't indict a sitting vice president. And they're like, you know what? Let's find out. And he's like, uh, you know, <laughs> let's find out. So they said, if you resign, we will let you plead no contest to tax evasion. And so he resigned and then walked into a federal courthouse five minutes later and pleaded no contest. So wow. he didn't want to test it. Wow. Yeah. And there were all these similarities with like what's going on with Trump right now. And I he, love Rachel. And the thing about Spiro Agnew is like, he was just as like racist and like, just messed up as as Trump in all these it's ways. So like, so talking about like the fake media and like the media's biased and like uh, history doesn't repeat it. it, rhymes. it you, you got what it's, do you think? It's a good. It's a good set of episodes. See, the problem is Pence needs to have a bag man. Yeah, because otherwise it's then we get Pence. Right. I'm not so worried about that. I don't think Pence can win. I would rather have Pence in right now than have Trump in right now. Because Trump is so much instability yeah. that he could literally start a trade war. Now you war. say that, then all of a sudden we're living in The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm not. The, right. As a cis <laughs> white man. Like, well, I specifically know. am living I'm like, in The Handmaid's Tale. Tale. <laughs> I didn't need to round out his force and we were going to go golfing last week. So <laughs> it's not going to affect me. My daughters, uh, right. yeah, <laughs> they're mixed race. Yeah. He's going to be like, yeah, no. Literally, when I moved into my house in Brentwood, the neighbor next to me, like, Speaking of casual racism, like yeah. she's like, oh, you moved in next door. I'm like, yeah, I moved in next door. She's like, oh, it's a wonderful house. I knew the two generations who lived there before. Da, da, da. She goes, oh, I saw your uh, cleaning lady the other day. Oh, no. I said, you saw my cleaning lady. I don't have a cleaning lady. She goes, yeah, the Asian one, the Chinese one, the Oriental. And I was like, mm. I was like wow, that's my wife. I was just like, wow. oh my Lord. That happened to my dad once where somebody came up to our house and was like, I thought he was the gardener. And he's like, hey, do you do gardens? Can you get a quote for yours? He's like, <laughs> he was, I mean, he was working in the yard because it's his front yard. Yeah, but right. like the guy's like, you know, yeah. can yeah. you find like the guy who owns a house here? Like, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Comprende English, yeah, amigo. Yeah, <laughs> Casual <laughs> racism. Yeah. I had a family member who, this is why I think it's like important we talk about this stuff because there's no normal conversations about this. And I had a family member who says, oh, your girlfriend is Oriental. I said, you know, uh, we don't use that word anymore. Yeah. It's considered a derogatory to Asian people. And, she goes, and he, uh, this person, he says, um, well, that makes no sense. And I said, no, I'm, I'm telling you it's true. He's like, no, that can't possibly be true because you have the Oriental Express, you have Oriental rugs. Like people say this all the time. It's not a racist word. I'm like, okay, <laughs> those are grandfathered in. Uh, as objects, and they're but objects. They're objects. <laughs> <laughs> this is a whole region of the world where twenty-five countries are, were referred to as one. Now they each have their own identity, and they're slightly different cultures, like very different. China, India. Yeah. yeah, but also, I mean, the meanings of words change, and we can say that things that were maybe socially acceptable before are no longer, you know, no longer cool. Well, right. I mean, listen, yeah. 10 years ago, I was dropping the R word on this podcast, oh. saying retarded. Yeah. Like, it was, I grew up in Brooklyn, that was like, we described everything as retarded. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, somebody, somebody, I tell the story many times on this podcast, somebody emailed me, and then also my friend, a very close friend said, you know, when you say that, and I hear it on the podcast, it makes me sad. I said, why is that? He said, we don't know this, but I have a brother who's in an institution who is mentally uh, handicapped and uh, Down syndrome, whatever. And um, I don't mean to be that guy to police speech or whatever. It was a decade ago, so it was like a different time. Political correctness was kind of like people didn't like it. And I was like, wow, I don't need to use that word. I'll just say stupid when I mean stupid. Uh People used to use the word gay to mean stupid. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense to me anyway. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in, you know, growing up in the 80s, there are things that we said in junior high that I'm like, I can't right. believe, yeah. you know, the way that were we completely talked. inappropriate. Absolutely, absolutely. It's good that things have changed. You know, it's good that people who, you know, have a tough enough time, gay people, black people, whatever, people who have handicaps, it's just great that like, people don't have to have their feelings hurt or feel less of themselves just by words people use. 
Yeah. It's so good to like give old people a little bit of like a sit down like I did with the Oriental comment and just hey, explain you talk it to, to Louis them. C.K.? Oh, God. Oh, don't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> did you listen to it? I read the transcript and I was I like, My wife and I, I listened to it. And, you know, like, number one, he's always said things that are very disturbing and like, oh, did he really say that? Mm-hmm. Like, that's really, forget about racist, just very. Like, he, pushed, he pushed boundaries. He pushed the boundaries like all the time. And it was like, I couldn't laugh at him anymore. Yeah. Especially when he went after the kids in the school shooting. I was like, that was, well, that's just. I just, you know, we don't really need him. Ugh. Do we? That was the thing that I said. Is, it, is, it, is he necessary? Enough. It's like, he, first off, he has enough money. He doesn't need to work. No. So he's not, yeah. we don't owe him a, like anything. No. But also like, if he goes away, are we worse off? Right. Like. No, some other funny person. And he's an obviously not smart enough to read the room. Well, that was the thing that I thought was so weird. Is not, not just the room, yeah, but like the, 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 the context culture. of society. Like for some, if you're this a is, comedian. But, but part of, of his thing before was that he was sort of self-aware. Yeah. Right? He was like, I have this shame and I know I'm a bad person. But it's like his new. Where did that go? The new shtick is like, you know. Don't give a F. Yeah. And it's like. Yeah, that give is actually, no F. And it's weirdly like. You know, suddenly do you now Trumpian. lack self awareness? That like Yeah, it's very Trumpian. Well, I, I think if in retrospect we now realize that yes, he did lack well, yeah, self awareness. Absolutely, but it's like, you know, it, it, it you know You can't be self aware and pull your junk out, you know, when you're talking to female colleagues. So, so absolutely like, yeah, I'm gonna, Okay everybody, that's another absolutely, incredible absolutely, episode of this. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, but, and, and and the only thing that he should have done was he, well, there's two things. Either go away forever. Yes. Or if you come back, Keep you, you have to, you have to, I mean, it's like what, you know, when Dan Harmon came out with, I don't know if you saw this, where like his apology to, it was a woman that he had worked with and he had basically like sexually harassed her and mm. like really wanted to date her and like wouldn't give up mm. and was like, gaslighting her like crazy. And he came out on his podcast and said, you know, I really, what I did was wrong. I was doing this to her. I tried to make it seem like I was this cool feminist guy and that like she couldn't possibly be right and that I was sexually harassing her. And, um, you know, and, and she actually said, you know, that, that was how you should do an apology. Yeah. You know, is you have to acknowledge what you did, be self-aware and try to not do that again. Yeah. And if it's what you did was especially egregious, maybe you don't come back. It's like right. the fact that like Justin Caldback is trying to like, Ugh. you know, come back. I had like a friend of mine that got pinged by him. Hey, let's, we, like, we should talk. I want to talk. And she's just like, go away. No, yeah. Wait, go soon, away. Dude. Just don't not, come soon. back. Too soon. Yeah. Take a break. Take a break forever. It might be forever. Yeah. yeah. Go into go into real estate or something. You know, yeah. like just change your name. Out. Yeah. Stay yeah. out of tech. Or maybe change your name. Like so, go to another. Uh, Justin, if you're listening, don't don't contact. Yeah, don't DM me. No. DM's closed. All right. Listen, <laughs> this has been amazing. Uh, hey, uh, synthetic reality. Go to beta dot works slash camp. Uh, Monique Wood. Ard, W O D A R D, Woodard. <laughs> we'll see you. Uh, thank you, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. If you want to come to Launch Festival Sydney, go to launchfestivalsydney.com slash tickets or launchfestival.com slash founder pass. We give away a thousand free founder passes and you will get to hear the amazing speaker, Monique, who will be giving a talk <laughs> on raising your first round. You better come. It's a, we had a heck of a time last time. You got to come. It's a, it's a great. Have you been to Sydney? I have not. I've not been what to What a Australia. wonderful city. Imagine if you took uh, the city by the bay here, yeah. got rid of the crime and all the gritty and excrement on the street and all the toxicity tenderloin drugs everything madness murder what do you have left sydney <laughs> you would have sydney a beautiful a great city. high functioning I, I just city. can't even imagine it <laughs> imagine a city by the bay that is delightful and crime free and it's just so nice i love sydney i love going maybe to sydney. we should all just move there yeah I have to move the tech industry there. <laughs> yeah. honestly like i went to tokyo you've been to tokyo i've been to tokyo oh my lord so i was good. in tokyo and i literally like the other day i just tweeted i want to go back to tokyo for a month mm-hmm. i had such a great experience I, if this doesn't work out for me here yeah. in silicon valley i was in lisbon in december amazing wonderful city yeah so good a web summit no oh okay i was just i heard that's chaos are they still in Lisbon. Yeah, they're still in Lisbon. All right, listen, if they try to charge you $8,000 and give you 50% <laughs> off and you pay $4,000 for your startup package, you're an idiot. Don't waste your money, okay? <laughs> it's a scam. Okay, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Service. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.